Good afternoon, guys. This is Saba. I've decided it's time for me to read a story to you, too. I've chosen Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. It was first published in 1883, 137 years ago. He starts it out with a poem to the hesitating purchaser. If sailor tales to sailor tunes, storm and adventure, heat and cold, if schooners, islands and maroons, and buccaneers and buried gold, and all the old romance retold exactly in the ancient way, can please, as me they pleased of old, the wiser youngsters of today, so be it, and fall on, if not, if studious youth, no, and I know you are, no longer crave his ancient appetites forgot, Kingston or Ballantine the Brave, or Cooper of the Wood and Wave, Cooper of the Wood and Wave, so be it also, and may I and all my pirates share the grave where these and their creations lie. I have to tell you, I don't know who Kingston, Ballantine the Brave, or Cooper of the Wood and Wave were. There's a map of Treasure Island, which I will show you. It's a little hard to see, but here it is. Let's see. At the top it says unreadable. Anyway, there's Treasure Island. Uh, you can see there's the compass. That's north, east, west, and here's the island with forests and mountains and lagoons. Part one, the old buccaneer. Chapter one, the old sea dog at the Admiral Benbow. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen, having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted. I take up my pen in the year of grace 17-something or other and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow Inn and the brown old seaman with the saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. A saber, by the way, is a sword, kind of a curved sword. I remember him as if it were yesterday as he came plodding to the inn door his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrow, a wheelbarrow, a tall, strong, heavy, nut-brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred with black broken nails, and the saber cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cove and whistling to himself as he did so, and then breaking out in that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. In the high, old, tottering voice that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the capstan bars. The capstan was a... Uh, uh, a winch that we used to to uh, pull up the anchor. It would wind up the anchor chain, so the anchor would come up on the, on the ship. Then he rapped on the door with a bit of stick, like a hand spike that he carried. And when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum. This, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly, like a connoisseur lingering on the taste and still looking about him at the cliffs and up at our signboard. This is a handy cove, says he at length, and a pleasant situated grog, grog shop. Much company, mate? My father told him, no, very little company. The more was the pity, meaning he wasn't getting any business and not making any money. Well then, said he, this is the berth for me. Here you, matey, he cried to the man who trundled the barrow. Bring up alongside and help up my chest. I'll stay here a bit, he continued. I'm a plain man. Rum and bacon and eggs is what I want. And that head up there for to watch ships off. 
What you might call me? You might call me Captain. Oh, I see what you're at. There. And he threw down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. You can tell me when I've worked through that, says he, looking as fierce as a commander. And indeed, bad as his clothes were, and coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast. The people who, when you sailed before the mast, that meant you slept in the front of the ship, the forecastle, and you were a, uh, you were a lowly sailor, not one of the officers. But he seemed like a mate or skipper, accustomed to be obeyed or to strike, meaning if you didn't obey, he would hit you. The man who came with the barrow told us the mail had set him down the morning before at the Royal George, that he had inquired what inns there were along the coast, and hearing ours well spoken of, I suppose, and described as lonely, had chosen it from the others for his place of residence. And that was all we could learn of our guest. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung round a cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlor next the fire and drank rum and water very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to, only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a foghorn. And we and the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring men had gone by along the road. At first, we thought it was the want of company of his own kind that made him ask this question. But at last we began to see he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman put up at the Admiral Benbow, as now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol, he would look, at him, look in at him through the curtain door before he entered the parlor. And he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, there was no secret about the matter, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a silver fourpenny on the first of every month if I would only keep my weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg and let him know the moment he appeared. Often enough, when the first of the month came round and I applied to him for my wage, he would only blow through his nose at me and stare me down. But before the week was out, he was sure to think better of it, bring me my fourpenny piece, and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams, I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of creature who had never had but the one leg and that in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. Oy. And altogether, I paid pretty dear for my monthly fourpenny piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. Here's another picture. This is our, let's see, there he is. Uh, okay, there's a couple of uh, hams hanging from the rafters, the fire, the bellows, the fire bellows over there, and there's our seaman sitting there with a glass of rum in his hand and his saber over here. And he's got buckle shoes and a pitcher of water. But though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. There were nights when he took a deal more rum and water than his head would carry, and then he would sometimes sit 
and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody. But sometimes he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I have heard the house shaking with yo ho ho and a bottle of rum, all the neighbors joining in for dear life with the fear of death upon them, and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits, he was the most overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on the table for silence all round. He would fly up in a passion of anger at a question, or sometimes because none was put, and so he judged the company was not following his story. Nor would he allow anyone to leave the inn till he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. His stories were what frightened people worst of all. Dreadful stories they were about hangings and walking the plank and storms at sea and the dry Tortugas, those are islands off the coast of Africa, and wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea, and the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. My father was always saying the inn would be ruined, for people would soon cease coming there to be tyrannized over and put down and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but on looking back, they rather liked it. It was a fine excitement in a quiet country life, and there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a true sea dog and a real old salt, and such like names, and saying there was the sort of man that made England terrible at sea. In one way, indeed, he bade fair to ruin us, for he kept on staying week after week, and at last, month after month, so that all the money had been long exhausted, and still my father never plucked up the heart to insist on having more. If ever he mentioned it, the captain blew through his nose so loudly that you might say he roared and stared my poor father out of the room. I've seen him wringing his hands after such a rebuff, and I'm sure the annoyance and the terror he lived in must have greatly ha hastened his early and unhappy death. All the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatever in his dress but to buy some stockings from a hawker. One of the cocks of his hat having fallen down, he let it hang from that day forth, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. He had one of those three-corner hats, like the Patriots were in Boston. He let it hang from that day forth, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. I remember the appearance of his coat, which he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which, before the end, was nothing but patches. He never wrote or received a letter, and he never spoke with any but the neighbors and with these, for the most part, only when drunk on rum. The great sea chest none of us had ever seen open. He was only once crossed, and that was toward the end, when my poor father was far gone in a decline that took him off. Dr. Lindsay came late one afternoon to see the patient, his father, took a bit of dinner from my mother, and went into the parlor to smoke a pipe, until his horse should come down from the hamlet, for we had no stabling at the old Benbow, no stabling, no, no stable for the horse. I followed him in, and I remembered observing the contrast, the neat, bright doctor, with his powder as white as snow, his hair was powdered, and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners, made with the coltish country folk, and above all with that filthy, heavy, bleared scarecrow of a pirate of ours, sitting far gone in rum with his arms on the table. The 
suddenly he, the captain that is, began to pipe up his eternal song. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil have done for the rest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. At first I had supposed the dead man's chest to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room, and the thought had been mingled in my nightmares with that of the one-legged seafaring man. But by this time we'd all long ceased to pay any particular notice to the song. It was new that night to nobody but Dr. Livesey, and on him I observed it did not produce an agreeable effect. For he looked up for the moment quite angrily before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener, on a new cure for the rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music and at last flapped his hand upon the table before him in a way we all knew to mean silence. The voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Lindsay's. He went on as before, speaking clear and kind and drawing briskly at the pipe between every word or two. The captain glared at him for a while, flapped his hand again, glared still harder, and at last broke out with a villainous low oath. Silence there between decks! Were you addressing me, sir, says the doctor? And when the ruffian had told him with another oath that this was so, I have only one thing to say to you, sir, replies the doctor, that if you keep on drinking rum, the world will soon be quit of a very dirty scoundrel. The old man's fury was awful. He sprang to his feet, drew and opened a sailor's clasped knife, and balancing it open on the palm of his hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so much as moved. He spoke to him, as before, over his shoulder, and in the same tone of voice, rather high so that all the room might hear, but perfectly calm and steady, if you do not put that knife this instant in your pocket, I promise, upon my honor, you shall hang at next assizes. Those were the courts. They had a traveling court. Came around every few months. Then followed a battle of looks between them, but the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a beaten dog. And now, sir, continued the doctor, since I now know there's such a fellow in my district, you may count I'll have an eye upon you day and night. I'm not a doctor only. I'm a magistrate, a judge. And if I catch a breath of complaint against you, if it's only for a piece of incivility like tonight's, I'll take effectual means to have you hunted down and routed out of this. Let that suffice. Soon after, Dr. Lindsay's horse came to the door, and he rode away. But the captain held his peace that evening, and for many evenings to come. That's the end of the chapter. We'll pick it up soon.